So the first question which arises is, is the tiny carbon cycle uh, driving the huge water cycle or is it piggybacking on it? Well, let us look at the carbon cycle. We have that much carbon uh, in uh, CO2 in the atmosphere in those units. Okay? Note that in fact 95% or something like that of that, of that atmospheric carbon cycle is controlled by biology, by photosynthesis respiration with at least that much per year. A similar thing is happening in the oceans. And of course, there is also a physical uh, uh, dissolution and, and, uh, and gassing of the ocean. In fact, this number, uh, this number may be too small. Just a few months ago, it, uh, it, there was an argument, I forget, it, I think it was in, in nature or in science, that this number is something like 150 or 160, not 120. In any case, it's huge. You essentially drive the entire equivalent of the atmospheric carbon dioxide or carbon via biology every five, six years. Okay? This is absolutely controlling. In contrast, our contribution, and it may not be all ours, is somewhere of this order, so maybe about 5% or less of the atmospheric, uh, of the uh, carbon cycle, annual carbon cycle. And even from that, we don't know when about a quarter of this amount, where does it disappear? This is so-called missing thing. So this just tells you how little do we know about carbon cycle. Okay? But whatever it is, this is by far the dominant control of the atmospheric carbon cycle. It's the biology. That this is so, you see on this picture, this is from NASA. Here we have about 10 years. This is north, uh, well, uh, from north uh, latitudes to the equator and to the southern latitudes, southern, and this is the CO2 concentrations. Firstly, what you see that there is slightly more CO2 in the northern hemisphere than in the southern hemisphere. There are bigger oscillations, seasonal oscillations. Why? Because most of the land is in, is in the northern hemisphere. So, but what you are seeing is really that on the time scales of years, decades, or even long centuries, it's really the biology which is absolutely controlling the atmospheric carbon budget, CO2. Now, what is it controlling with? Well, photosynthesis respiration. Now, what controls the photosynthesis? So most of the photosynthesis is in the tropical forest. So example of Amazon or New Guinea, so I show you the Amazon. So in the Amazon, what you're seeing that actually what controls the photosynthesis? Well, is the sun. When the sun is rising, the so-called leaf index of photosynthesis is rising as well. It is photosynthesis. You need photons, okay? And note that in fact, the most of the photosynthesis is in the dry season, not in the wet season. Why? Because you have less clouds. So you get more photons, okay? This is really what's driving it, nothing else. Well, what's more, however, when you do photosynthesis, and what somehow is just disregarded or not taken, or is it just there? Water cycle is just there. It just reacts. Like the US just reacts to, to, uh, uh, to Puerto Rico. Otherwise, it's just there. Okay? So when you, we are supposed to plant the trees. Okay? So of course, we get CO2 during photosynthesis in. But the same plant during the same stomata has to transpire back into the atmosphere something like, well, uh, water vapor, water. And how big it is, you see it here. This is uh, the first day of spring, 21st of March in my backyard. You see how much water it needs? Water is extremely important. In fact, what you have when you do photosynthesis, we are supposed to plant the trees to lower the CO2 levels. Well, but for every single CO2, that plant has to transpire back, or through the plant has, uh, has to be transpired back almost 1,000 molecules of water and back into the atmosphere. One to 1,000, okay? Now, remember, 
for the actual photosynthesis, the reaction is water plus CO2 gives you organic matter plus oxygen. Okay? So it's one CO2, one water. So why this, what is this 999 or how many, how many hundreds of molecules of water, what is it for? And that's a huge amount of energy which you need to drive that water from the soil all the way back to the atmosphere. In fact, the entire energy of the sun is almost used for driving this water conveyor belt through back into the atmosphere as opposed to a relatively small amount, which is for CO2. Why is, it, why is it there? Because you need this conveyor belt because this is bringing you food, nutrients. If you have no conveyor belt, if you have nothing to bring you food, you will have no life. If you have no life, you will have no carbon cycle. Okay? So this is really the, uh, the existence of this energy flow, this water cycle, is the precondition for the existence of life for maintaining the photosynthesis respiration, and not the consequence of it. And the entire, almost the entire solar energy is used for this. Now, so the water and carbon cycle are co-driven by solar energy, but it is the existence of the water conveyor belt that is the precondition, not the other way around. And this is the same is true not only for biological cycle, but for inorganic cycle. If you didn't have water, you wouldn't have weathering, you wouldn't have erosion, you wouldn't have transport, you wouldn't have sedimentation. Okay? If you didn't have carbon, that still would go on. So the carbonation reactions would be replaced by sulfuration reaction or something like that, but it still would go on. But without water, nothing would happen. This is the fundamental cycle, not fundamental energy, solar energy redistribution on this planet. Everything else is just, just parasiting on it. So can we test it? Well, what you have plotted here, this is the precipitation. And this, uh, this is the uh, net primary productivity of, if you, if you wish, photosynthesis. These are, these are measurements, uh, field measurements, in the jungles. And this is going to the poles, different ecosystems. What you are seeing here, you see some kind of a plateau, and then actually decline with, uh, with precipitation as you go towards higher latitude. Why is this plateau here? This plateau is here because the system in the jungles works at the maximum capacity with respect to the incoming solar energy. This is something like 6 to 8 percent. This is how the biological systems work. And it, uh, the, uh, the photovoltaic cells, the best ones today, uh, so this is about 6 to 8 percent. The cells best are about uh, almost 50 percent. But those cells cost $5,000 per square centimeter. Okay? The, as you go towards the poles in those ecosystems, something is holding it back. It's not the sun. You have plenty of sun. It's the amount of available water. Here, water plays no role. We have plenty of water. You know, the precipitation or up. The plateau is simply because this is the amount of radiation of photons coming from the sun, which you can use. But here, as you go towards higher and higher latitudes, it's water which is limiting it. This has nothing to do with CO2, because CO2 is more or less the same whether it's in the Amazon jungle or North Pole. It has also nothing to do with uh, nutrients. This spread may be due to limitations of nutrients, but this plateau has nothing to do with nutrients. Okay? The nutrients are in many ecosystems as good in here as they are here. So this is the fundamental pattern. Now, can, can we test it? Okay. So if what I have told you, this 1,000 to 1 ratio is correct, then the amount of water which is involved in photosynthesis, if I made this same plot of precipitation for the same ecosystems, the amount of water involved in photosynthesis uh, would have to give me exactly the same pattern, only 1,000 times bigger. OK? To, uh, follow what I'm saying? So we decided that we could test it. Actually, we, worked, we wanted to do the carbon budget. 
uh, to, to, uh, to get the carbon credits for Canada because it's supposedly that missing 25% was in boreal forest. Well, we didn't find it, unfortunately. But so we decided to work on watersheds for getting the, vo the water budget. This has nothing to do, this is totally calculated water budget, totally independent of carbon dioxide or carbon cycle. Why you can do it in watersheds, especially on the bigger watersheds? Because you can treat it as a closed system. Because the precipitation in the watershed, you essentially can get from the web, because that's available. The amount of water coming out of the system by, by discharge, by runoff, at the end of at the mouth of the river, for bigger rivers, again, there are data for, for discharge for decades, many times. So you can get it out of there. So precipitation minus discharge gives you evapotranspiration. This is the water which is going back into the atmosphere. Now the problem is that it's, there is evaporation and transpiration, and it's very difficult to, to decide how much of what. Transpiration is photosynthesis, okay? So we developed the, because uh, physical evaporation, either from the water bodies or from the top of the leaves, is isotopically doesn't do uh, much to the isotope. Uh, no, it fractionates, so isotopes of oxygen and carbon, whereas this uh, transpiration, that means photosynthesis through plants, doesn't do it. We develop a technique using isotopes uh, to, to divide how much there is evaporation, uh, evaporation, and then the rest was transpiration. So we did this for a number of watersheds. These watersheds covered everything from uh, Canada through uh, boreal to temperate to to tropical, to dr uh, dry, and so on. That was about 15 watersheds. Every one of those watersheds is about one PhD or one postdoc. So it uh, was a lot of monitoring, lots of measuring. Uh, so, so it's maybe about 40, uh, 40 years uh, of uh, 40 work years. So, uh, and we made a water budget for all these watersheds. Now, the results, I cannot show you how it was done because, uh, because of the time but I can show you at least two results. I can show you a result for one watershed, which is here from the, uh, from the uh, sun-limited system in the jungle, and one here from water-limited system. When you look on the jungle, this is Papua New Guinea, this is the Fly River. So what you have there, there is a huge amount of precipitation, eight meters of water pre uh, precipitation every year. From that water, however, because your limitation is uh, the, actually 60% just flows back. It has no use because the biology cannot use it. The sun is not there, enough, not enough sun, not enough photons, okay? The limitation is by the sun. So from canopy and from uh, surface evaporation, you have something like another 25%. But the actual amount of water uh, used in photosynthesis here from, is only about 10% of the total budget. It's still a very big number. It's uh, a meter of water which is used in photosynthesis, but uh, uh, the amount of water is enormous, so it's, it's about 10%. If you go to the other uh, uh, end of the system, which is the Saskatchewan River Basin in Canada, there, this is the water-limited system. What you see here, the precipitation is much less, only half a meter. From that half a meter, actually only about 20% uh, is runoff, another maybe 30% is in evaporation, but half of the water which precipitate there is being reused during transpiration. This is a recycling system because it's water limited. Okay? So, but that's only a mm, quarter of a meter. Okay, it's much less. So when you take the amount of water involved and plot it against precipitation for all these basins, so this is what you get. Remember, this was the picture for photosynthesis for carbon. And this is now each of those basins I was discussing with you. This is the basin in Papua New Guinea. In fact, it's way up here somewhere because it's broken here. And so you have a plateau, and as you go towards higher latitudes, then it's exactly the same picture. This is the Saskatchewan basin. So it's exactly the same picture as for carbon. It's only 1,000 times bigger. Okay? 
So it's 1,000 to 1 ratio. This is no accident. Okay. So it is the carbon cycle piggybacking on the water cycle. But, and this is all driven by the sun. Oh, how does it work? So how does this system work? Well, if you have stronger sun, what happens? You have more photons. So this plateau will move up. At the same time, you will have more evaporation. It will be warmer, more evaporation, more moisture in the atmosphere. So there will be more precipitation. So it will move to the right. At the same time, because you have more evaporation in the tropics, more water will be transported up to the high latitudes. There will be more rain in the high latitudes, so it will be more water over here. So the whole picture with stronger sun will move up and to the right. When the sun becomes weaker, the whole picture will move down and to the left. But it's driven and modulated by the sun. OK? So, and in fact, the outcome of this is we are, we are supposed to plant the trees to lower the CO2. No. They will be higher CO2. Why? Because when the whole picture moves up, when you have more biosphere, of course you have more trees taking the CO2. But when you have more trees, you have more leaves. Leaves fall down. Leaves rot. OK? And when you have high temperature, you have more bacteria, there is more respiration. The CO2 goes back. So the bigger the biosphere, the more leaves, the more CO2 will be in the atmosphere. It's like when you have two banks. When the banks are small, there is little money moving in between in the mortgages or whatever. The bigger the bank, the more money is moving in between. And it has to be, because otherwise the system would collapse. So, and at the same time, the same will be happening in the sea. At the same time, because sea will be warmer, the, uh, the, uh, the CO2 will degas also. So the more soil, the more higher temperature, the more sun, the more CO2, not less CO2. Okay? So that this is the case you can see from here. So that both water cycle and carbon cycle are driven by the, by the sun. This is the Paraná Basin, which is the fifth biggest uh, watershed in terms of water in the world. And this is the discharge from the Paraná Basin, which is the blue. And this is the solar, uh, solar activity over the last years based on sunspot cycle. Just follows. The increase in solar activity, actually, these are the 11 year cycles. And look, every single minimum in the, cycle, in the uh, solar cycle is followed by a minimum in precipitation except 1944, I don't know why, I have no clue, but except for 1944, every single minimum is followed by uh, decreasing precipitation, less humidity, and less net primary productivity. Surely, it's not the less sun because it's less raining in the US. It's the other way around. Okay? So the situation is like this one. The system works when the sun really works an atmospheric water cycle. That, in turn, generates the climate. And the climate decides then how much jungle, how much tundra, and so on we will have, not the other way around. Okay? There will be a feedback, but this is a secondary feedback, much smaller than this one. So it's a top-driven situation. It's a carbon cycle piggybacking on the water cycle, not driving it. Okay. So atmospheric carbon dioxide levels are therefore a response to changes in the amount of incoming solar energy and should follow changes in climate. And that this is so, you know it, for example, from the ice cores. But the point which I'm trying to make is so not only the water vapor, vapor is by far the most important greenhouse gas, and it is likely via water cycle that uh, climate is being modulated, but any input of energy into the water cycle from any source, source would generate more water vapor as warmer and better climate. Just because we call it prescribed CO2 doesn't mean it's CO2. We could call it prescribed sun. 
or we could call it prescribe blue cheese. At the end, you will come up with the warmer and wetter climate, only in this case it would be blue, uh, caused by blue cheese. Okay? So the models are not specific. The water cycle doesn't care. To water cycle, it's all energy. Okay? So where is this energy coming from? Is it coming from the sun, <coughs> like here? Or is it coming, as the IPCC says, from CO2? Well, if it is coming from the sun, we would have a correlation of the, of the uh, climate with the solar activity. If it's coming from the CO2, we would have to, to have a correlation of climate with CO2. So which one is it? Fortunately, for the last 40,000 years or so, we have, we have a way of estimating uh, so, uh, the activity of the sun. And it's based on cosmic rays. I'm not going to explain to you how it works because I'm leaving this portion to both Neil and uh, <laughs> Henrik to, to go on to explain the physics and everything, how it works. But essentially, we, uh, we have cosmic rays. And the, when cosmic rays hit the atmosphere, they produce a shower of so-called cosmogenic nuclides, beryllium-10, carbon-14, and so on. And this we can measure. The amount of those uh, cosmogenic nuclei, uh, nuclides is, uh, uh, is dependent on the number of cosmic rays hitting the atmosphere of the Earth. But the number of cosmic rays hitting the atmosphere of the Earth depends on the activity of the sun. Because, uh, because cosmic rays, we are shielded uh, from cosmic rays by electromagnetic field around the sun, which is called uh, heliosphere, and electromagnetic field around the Earth, which is the magnetosphere. Okay? If it were there, we would be well, fried. Okay? So when the sun is strong, the halo sphere and so on and, uh, is much bigger, much stronger, so deflects most cosmic rays away. But when the sun is weak, it's not only colder, but it also, uh, uh, the, uh, this uh, defense shrinks and allows more cosmic rays to come in. And when it's colder, we will have more barium 10, more carbon 14. Okay? So that would be correlation with, with the sun. Uh, on the other hand, if it were correlation, if it, if it were with the, if this uh, CO2 were driving, then the correlations would have to be with CO2. And of course, we have those CO2 uh, data, for example, in the, in the um, ice cores or elsewhere. But uh, I'm going to show you. So the question, therefore, is where uh, so where is this energy coming from? Is it related to the sun? Or is it related to uh, greenhouse gases, atmospheric greenhouse, uh, anthropogenic greenhouse gases? I told you the models really cannot decide. To models, it doesn't care. It's energy. Okay? So you have to look at the record. So let's look at the, the record. Which correlations are there? Now I'm going to show you the last 10,000 years. We have what we call drop stones. What are drop stones? You know, when the glaciers move, for example, over Greenland, they are, they are bulldozing the rock. And they, the rocks, rocks are being frozen into the glacier. And then when they carve and move out past Labrador or whatever into the Atlantic, they start melting. And they are dropping the stones. For example, this is one of the such stones in Africa. This one is 600 million years old. But you have also these stones may be a very, very tiny one. So most of them are very tiny. Let's look on land. On land, we have caves. So this is the cave, which was already mentioned here, in the Alps. And in the caves, we have stalagmites. And they have growth rings, like trees. So we can sample those growth rings, measure the oxygen 1816 ratio, which is a reflection of climate, not necessarily temperature. And we can also date those growth rings. So what you are seeing here, this is the roughly the temperature, but it's really uh, climate. So when it was this way, it's cold. When it was this way, it's relatively warm. Is it a temperature record, our climate record? Of course it is, because this was medieval climate optimum. You see, it was also the highest temperature. How warm was it? Well, this was the time when Greenland was Greenland. You, I think you had about 300 or something like that farms in Greenland. 
they were even producing barley. How many farms do we have in Greenland today which are producing barley? So it was one. Okay. This was also the time when the Vikings came to America. This is the, uh, where they landed in, in Newfoundland. That's, uh, uh, that's now rebuilding, uh, that's, but that was their original landing spot. This was followed by <coughs> Little Ice Age, and you see the, te uh, the temperature went down. This was until about 1850. Okay. Was it cold? Of course it was cold. We have all those pictures all over the world, from Europe and everywhere, when the rivers, everything was frozen. It was very cold. And it's all over the world, those data are there. So it is really the climate record. Now, when you compare it now, so this was the oxygen isotope, the blue one. And this is, again, carbon-14. And this is what CO2 was doing the whole 10,000 years, next to nothing. So which one is it? It's the sun. So to me, the system works like this. It is the sun which is driving, the, which is acting on the atmospheric water cycle with the help of aerosol generating climate. Climate decides what does the biology, and then you have a feedback. I'm not saying CO2 is not a greenhouse gas. I'm not saying it's doing nothing. But it's not that CO2 is everything and sun is nothing. It's, if anything, it's the other way around. OK? So actually, maybe I can finish at this. How does it really happen? The argument in IPCC, essentially, the whole uh, solar thing is, is just dismissed in about two or three sentences. Because sun does nothing, it cannot do anything, and so on. And that's it. Well. Because we don't know exactly the mechanism how the, uh, uh, how the uh, clouds are being made by, by cosmic rays or whatever. Now, personally, I don't care whether they are made by direct uh, uh, impact or whether it's an electrical field or whether it's, a, um, it's a by UV radiation or all the combinations or whatever. I still think that Henrik Svensvark's uh, mechanism is probably the best one at the moment we have or a combination of them. But however it is made, in my view, there is enough data to tell us it is done. OK? And it's the sun. And with that, I would like to finish. And I hope that I showed you something which is a reasonable observation of science. <laughs>